InDesign, one of my favorite applications. There are so many things that we can do with InDesign. Um, InDesign is the place where we put a lot of things together. It's also the application that lets us export to some of these wonderful new formats like EPUB, fixed EPUB, creating apps. We can do that within InDesign. But it's also the place where we just can put together print pieces, which is traditionally where it started, or PDFs that are going to be distributed on websites. So often, the workflow is that people are developing a lot of assets, images in Photoshop, logos in Illustrator, infographics in Illustrator, and then they're bringing them all into InDesign. One of the really cool developments in InDesign, though, is that they have many of the tools in Illustrator, and they have the effects panel from Photoshop, a lot of things that you could only do in Photoshop before. So there are things that we can do and just stay in InDesign, but it's perfectly fine to just bring things in from Photoshop and Illustrator. And you do not have to save those Photoshop and Illustrator files in a different format. For instance, traditionally we would have to save those in TIFF or EPS or something like that. You can just bring them in as native files. So just bring in that PSD file from Photoshop or bring in that AI file from Illustrator. And that way, if you make a change to that file in Illustrator, InDesign will update it for you automatically. It always asks permission, but it just go ahead and it updates. So today we're going to do a couple things. I'd like to go through the steps of just starting to create a brand new document. We're going to make a little two-page brochure here that would be folded into thirds. So the first thing we're going to do is just go to the file menu and create new file. So file new. And you'll notice that you've got several choices. So let me, just in case people are a little nervous about this choice, um, the document is just going to give you a file that you can add multiple pages to or you can have a one page. If you have a very long document, this is another awesome feature about InDesign, that is, let's say, I just finished two books that are, one is 420 pages and the other book is 360 pages, but it's made up of several sections. I don't want that InDesign file to be 410 pages. It's just too much for me to manage. I would like to be able to edit things in smaller files. You have a thing called a book that allows you to import each of those files, and let's just talk about in terms of chapters, okay? Chapter 2 knows that chapter 1 ended on page 18, so it knows that it needs to start the pagination for the next chapter on page 19. If I go back and delete five pages in the previous chapter, it knows that, and it makes all those changes to the other chapters if you were using consecutive pagination. So it's a wonderful tool for long documents. There are a lot of things you can do globally. You can have the footers automatically pull information from certain paragraphs, so you're not doing that by hand. Really nice feature. Um, a folio is for creating an app, so, um, and that's if anybody ends up deciding that they're going to go into multimedia, you may want to get some experience doing that. And then a library is just a container for used objects that you use quite often. For instance, let's say that you're working on a school newspaper or you're working on a club newsletter that gets repeated every month. So every month you need a logo or you need something. You can put them into the library and then they're always right at your fingertips. So we're going to choose new document, and we have several options that we can choose from. I'm going to choose print as my intent, but because it's just a two-pager, I'm going to turn off facing pages, say that I want two pages, and this is a brand new feature, this little preview down at the bottom, so if yours is not on, turn that on, because what used to happen is you would put in all of these specifications, and then you would see your document, and you'd go, oh, I forgot to turn this into landscape, or darn, I forgot to add big enough margins. So this way I get to see in the background exactly what I'm defining. You can always go back and change any of these settings, by the way. Nothing is carved in stone. It's just nice if you get it on the first try. It just saves you time. Um, we're going to make three columns. And I need to go back up here to orientation. I'm going to do it on a, a letter size piece of paper, but I'm going to go ahead and click landscape. Notice how that page flips sideways, which is what we're going to need if this is going to right fold this way. Moving to the bottom, I want much smaller margins because this is going to be a three column setup. So I'm going to put in 0.1667 inches. And this little lock symbol here between the, the two sides says that whatever I put into one of those fields gets put into all the others. 
All right, let's talk about uh, measurement systems. So InDesign allows you to use all of these different measurement systems. So points and pikas are traditional graphic artist uh, measurements. And the reason for that is the United States is one of the only countries that uses inches. Inches are really big. Think about that. Anything smaller than an inch is a decimal. So it's really hard when you're thinking, I want an eighth of an inch. What is that in decimal? You know, it's like 0 0.0125, 0 0.1167. So a lot of people like to work in whole numbers. Now, if you're in Europe, they all use centimeters and millimeters because they're very, very teeny whole numbers, right? Um, and then these are used in France or somewhere like that. So you can choose whatever you want as the default measurement system, but that doesn't mean that you can't override it with something else. So for example, let's say that I choose PICAs, right? And you, that's what I think yours is defaulting to is PICAs. In any of these areas up here, I can override anything, any measurement with the measurement system I want. I just have to tell InDesign that that's what I'm doing. So for example, let's say that I want this box to be three inches wide. I just go to my width up in my control panel and type 3 I in. Now it knows that I want 3 inches, not 3 picas. And when I press tab, it makes the change and it converts it to the measurement system. Now here's something really cool. I love this about InDesign. Let's say that I like this, but I go, I, I just want that to be an eighth of an inch bigger. Well, that says right now it's 18 picas. What's 18 picas plus an eighth of an inch? I have no idea, right? So I can let InDesign do the math for me. So I'm going to say 18 picas plus, and um, I have no idea what, what an eighth of an inch is in inches, so I'm going to say um, 0.1667 inches. Okay, I've got two measurement systems in that and a mathematical equation. And when I press tab, voila, it does it for me, and it converts it to my default measurement system. I love that. So you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So it's plus, minus, um, slash is going to be your divide, and asterisk is going to be your multiple. All right. Now, if any of you want to, so that we're all working in the same measurement system, um, let's change tools here. I'm going to just get rid of that. Um, let's all change our measurement system so it's the same. So if everybody is more comfortable in inches, we can do that all together. Each ruler can have a different measurement system. So there are lots of ways you can change measurement systems. One is in your preferences, but a really quick visual way to do this is just right click in your ruler and I could have that be inches and I could have, I'd have to go do that again with my other ruler. But to do both at the same time, can everybody see that little intersection between the top ruler and the left ruler? If I right click in there and choose inches, it changes both measurement systems at the same time. And now I'm going to see inches in all of my number dialogues, all my number fields, okay? All right, I'm going to bring in an image. To, to bring anything into InDesign, we just use the same command file place. So that's video, sound, pictures, text. We always use this command. And I've got an image called cover image, but any image that you have on your laptop, just go ahead and find it and pop it in. And just place that up at the top corner. Now, my image, if I scroll out or zoom out, notice that my image is really wide, but it's not as tall. So in this case, I really don't want that all hanging off. I'm going to just change the size of my frame by grabbing the bottom right-hand corner and bringing it up to the outside edge of that page. But now, because the, it didn't change the size of the picture, and I, I can hold down certain keys to do that at the same time. What I really want is for this image to fill this, and then one of the sides is going to pour, be cut off a little bit, but I really want it to fill this. So I'm just going to right click, go to my fitting command, and choose, I'm going to show you both of these. There's fit content proportionally and fill frame proportionally. If I fit the content proportionally, I can see that it's taking the longest side and it's fitting it, but unfortunately that gives me white space top and bottom, and that's not really what I want. So again, I'm going to right click, fitting. But this time I'm going to fill the frame proportionally. When you fill a frame, the longer side gets cut off a little bit, but it takes the shorter side and it fills it. And it looks like my frame wasn't as big as my page, so I'm just going to choose that again. You can do this as many times as you want. 
Now, if your image was smaller than an eight and a half by 11, which some of yours might be, just drag that frame bottom right-hand corner down, snap it to the bottom corner of your page and use that. It may blow it up so that it's kind of blurry, but don't worry about that. We're not gonna publish this. All right, now I'm gonna add um, a logo. This is just an Illustrator file, but you could also add uh, another small picture if you wanted to. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and place and I'm looking for my naturalist logo here. And I'm just going to paste it out here on my, my pasteboard. You can use these pasteboards to put together combinations of images to work something out before you drag it onto the page. Anything on the pasteboard is not going to be printed by default. And I'm just going to shrink that frame around this just a little bit so it'll fit better. And then I'm just going to drag it onto my page and put it in this third column. All right, to zoom in, um, I can go ahead and grab my zoom tool, or I can just use the keyboard equivalent command spacebar on my Macintosh and on my PC, I can use control spacebar. And notice that when you do that, it turns in to a magnifying glass instead of a pointer. And this is a real quick way to zoom in. I just draw a rectangle around the area that I want to zoom in. We call this a marquee, I let go, and there's my area here. So now I'm going to grab the line tool because what I want is I want a line that's going to go underneath that logo, another line further down, and then I want to put some text underneath both of these. Okay? So we're going to do the lines first. I'm just going to click on that tool and let's just drag it across this column. I'm going to use my shift key to make sure that it makes a straight line. And I don't really like the line because it doesn't even have a stroke to it. So I'm going to change its width and give it a color. Up in my control panel, this is a responsive control panel. Depending on what tool I have, it's going to change the commands that are available up here. InDesign's trying to give its best guess about what commands you would use with that tool. Since I have the stroke tool selected or the line tool selected, it's giving me options that would modify that. At any point, I can also go down to my panels over here on the right, and I can open that panel, close it, and notice that it expands and collapses each time I click on the name of that panel. But the control panel is a combination of commands that are coming from these panels. All right, let's change that stroke. I'm going to go over here and choose two points and the color I would really like a, a yellow that kind of matches this one there are a couple ways I can do that if I have something in my image that I like I'm gonna just change this really quickly to a higher display performance you see how blurry that image is right now InDesign is trying to save memory and trying to save CPU power by using typical display but if I choose high it's gonna clean that up and today's computers really don't have much of a problem doing that. All right, now the other thing I can do to get that color for the stroke is to use my eyedropper. And I can click on anything in this image, and it's going to change the color of that. So that's one way. I can pull a color right from the image. So for example, let's say that I was looking at her shirt, and I thought, oh, this would be a great color for that. It's really not, but... Now if I take a look at this, notice the color on that stroke. It's called the eyedropper and it's right above the zoom tool. And if it's not showing, it may be that the measure tool might be on top of it and you just hold it down. I'm going to go another route. I'm going to create that color a little differently. I'm going to go to my swatches panel over here on the right, and I'm going to go to my panel menu, which are these little menus at the top right corner, and choose New Color Swatch. This allows me to create a swatch that then gets kept in a little bit of something like a library. Your swatches panel is a container that holds all the colors that you've predefined. Now, how do I know what color to define? I happen to have here a um, some numbers for a color, but I was asked in the previous class, which is a great question, how do I know what numbers to find the color that I want? So sometimes what I do is I go to Spot and I choose one of these Pantone libraries like 
solid, solid coated or CMYK. And I just scroll down and I look for a color that I think would be a nice one for this. So let's say that I really like this uh, Pantone yellow here. I can go ahead and add that. And right now it's defined as a spot color, but later on I can convert that to a color that a printer would accept, which is CMYK. We did a little tiny CMYK introduction yesterday. CMYK are the four colors that all color print jobs are done with, traditionally. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So when you're looking at a newspaper and you see a color photo in that newspaper, that photo only has four colors. It's an optical illusion that our eye sees all those colors. Next time you're looking at a newspaper or a magazine, take a magnifying glass if you have one, put it over the top, and what you're going to see are hundreds of little tiny dots, and they're all cyan, magenta, yellow, or black. And they're put together in combinations that the eye then sees all these other colors. And that's traditional printing. If you want a spot color, a color that is metallic, let's say, then they have to put that down with mixed ink and they'll mix that up and it's more expensive to print. All right, let's go ahead with that stroke selected. Um, I've got that yellow applied to it. Let me just look real quickly. All right, and to duplicate that real quickly, I'm going to go back to my selection tool hover over the top of that, and as I press my mouse button down, I'm going to hold down my Option key and drag straight down, and that makes a duplicate of anything inside of InDesign. So now I have two that are exactly the same. Okay, let's add some text now. We can add text by either importing it, or if there's just a few words that we want to type, I just go over to my Type tool, which is the fourth tool down here, and just draw a rectangle using that tool in between the two yellow bars and the left and right guides for your third column. And let's type in wild trails. Wild trails. Select all of it. And it's obviously too small. We need it bigger. So I can change my size by dragging one of these predefined sizes, or I can just type in my own. Uh, that might be a little bit big. Let's say we don't see here size 40 or 50, right? So it's 48 to 60. All I have to do is type in whatever number I want, and that one's going to work probably a little bit better. I probably want that centered, so I'm going to move across that control panel, click on my Align Center. Luckily, all of these little icons have tooltips, so if you hover over them, you'll see what the name of that tooltip is, which is very helpful when you're starting out on a new application. And I'm not crazy about that font, so I am, I love Minion as a font, but um, I think I would really rather have uh, Lithos Pro. You guys can choose whatever font you want. And it's black, and that doesn't look very good, right, against that. So I'm going to select this type again, and I'm going to go over to my swatches panel, I'm going to fill it with paper. Now you're going to assume that paper is always going to be white. It will be inside of InDesign, but it will be the color of the paper that you print it on. So basically what it means is it's going to cut out any color behind it, and it's going to go through to the paper. So if you're printing on pink paper, it is going to be pink. So just be sure that you realize that. Most of us are printing on white paper, though. All right. Um, had a question, too, yesterday that came up. How would I center this vertically between these? I can bring this in and just move it down to where I feel like it's centered. And let's do a preview of that, okay? maybe a little bit more. Or if you want a mathematical center, just drag the top portion up to that rule, the bottom handle to the bottom here, and then right click and there's this great tool called text frame options. I love this command because it lets me do so many things with text. And one of the options here is vertical justification, top, center. All right, let's put another text box in here just really quickly. And one of the things that I'm gonna do to save myself time is I'm gonna duplicate this text box select the text and type in outdoor, which is the other word I want, and then just bring down the size 
what I think is going to be appropriate sitting underneath that naturalist, and one point is not going to do it. But how about, say, 15? All right. I'm going to double click on one of these handles, which shrinks the box to the size of the text automatically. InDesign loves to do things automatically for you, which I love. And I'm just going to slide it in right underneath there. And as I drag, can you see that line up here? These are called smart guides. So instead of having to calculate exactly whether something's centered or right aligned or using your align tool, all you have to do is as you drag, it's telling me that now it's at the center of the column because it's a purple line. And if I drag a little bit more, it's telling me now it's at the center of the naturalist. And I let go, and I don't have to measure that. Again, I'm just going to do a preview. And that's our front page. Everybody, um, drag over here to your pasteboard area, grab your rectangle tool, and just draw a, just a small, small box. Over to the left, towards the bottom of your tools panel, you'll see a little square donut, and you'll see another box sitting behind it that has a fill. Now, the other one may be in front. And as you click on any portion of that other option, notice that it comes to the front. When the square donut is in front, that's your stroke. And whatever color you choose is going to apply to the stroke of the object, not the fill. If you choose a color why the box is in front, it's going to fill that object. So we want this one in front. Anybody know what that red slash is for in almost all the applications? It means none, absolutely none. And if it is none, I'm going to give the stroke a color here because I won't be able to see this in a couple minutes if I don't. So let's say I make that stroke pink, right? Now, I'm going to deselect it. Oh, it's because I'm in preview here. And notice that I'm clicking in the middle of it. It's not selecting it because it's none. There's nothing there. It's just hollow. So let's fill that with a color by either clicking on the box and choosing a color from the swatches panel. Or if it had a stroke, you can always choose this little arrow to switch the two. That swaps the fill for the stroke. Now, once you have a little simple object here, let's duplicate this. Place your cursor over the object, and as you drag your mouse, hold down your option key. And every time you drag, you drag a copy. If you want that copy to be perfectly aligned horizontally or vertically, as you start to drag, hold down your shift key. And whatever direction you start to drag, InDesign is going to hold you to that. So as I start to drag down, notice it's not letting me go left or right. I mean, I'd have to really push it to do it. It's really trying to let me hold that vertical path so that I know that these are all aligned. Okay, now that we're blinded by that much pink, let's go ahead and get rid of that. Okay, let's move to page two. At any point in working in an InDesign document, I can always get an idea of where I am and how many pages I have by going to the Pages panel. Now, for this two-page brochure, I'm not going to use a master page, but if you have a multi-page document and you want a page number at the bottom of every page or you want something in a footer, that's when you want to use these master pages because whatever you put on a master page is exactly what's going to appear on every single page that's based on that master page. Anybody here ever use PowerPoint? Okay. You know how you have that master slide and you put things on that that you want to appear on every single page, every slide? That's like what a master page is. Except it's way better because it can do lots more stuff. <laughs> All right, I'm going to navigate to page two by just clicking, double clicking on page two, and I get my nice blank one. Again, I'm going to pop in a new image. This time I'm going to bring in that map. Notice it's a .ai file, which means it's an Illustrator file. So I just, somebody created this map in Illustrator, I can bring it in as an Illustrator file. InDesign can communicate just fine with that. This is a vector file. We'll talk more about this in our Illustrator session, which means that you can expand and contract it as much as you want, and it has no impact on the resolution, which is one of the reasons people use vectors for logos, where Photoshop files, rasterized files, you have a limited number of pixels, and as you stretch those, that's why sometimes when you take a, a picture on your cell phone, if it's an older cell phone, and you try to blow it up to like poster size, it's all blurry, it's because you had a set number of pixels. And when you expanded it, it didn't have enough. Vectors can be expanded indefinitely, and you'll get the resolution that you want. All right, let's uh, put some more text on the page here. Oh, let's do one more thing. Let's, um, I'm going to move 
my image down just a little bit, would you grab the line tool again? And let's just draw a line all the way across the top. Holding down your shift key will make sure that that line stays perfectly horizontal. And I'm going to increase the size of that rule to about you know, uh, eight points. And I definitely don't want that one to be pink. So I'm going to make sure that my stroke is in front. I can do that in my swatches panel, or I can do that over here in my tools panel. And I'm going to make that green. And maybe I'll do the maybe I'll do the same thing at the bottom. So if I want to do that, everybody can practice their duplication process. Hold down the option key and the shift key to make sure that it drags straight down. And I'll just snap that. When you are bringing in text, as I mentioned, there are a couple ways to do this. If you have a lot of text and somebody has typed that in in Microsoft Word or a text editing application, you can just import it, just place it. Or you can type, which most of us don't want to spend our time typing, unless it's just a word or two. And the third option is you can keep open some sort of text file. So that's the case with this. I've got a text file here. And the information, let's say that you've got to get an OK for the information that you have. And it's very small pieces of text. And maybe that I don't want to have a separate file for each one of these. So I can just put it in a text file, mark it so that people know what these are. So here's my main paragraph. Here's going to be my captions. Here's my copyright info. So I'm going to just select that main paragraph. And you guys can go into any Word document that you have right now, any text document, and just select the paragraph of text and copy it. Just using your standard copy command, Command-C on the Mac and Control-C on the PC. Then come back to InDesign and use your type tool. I'm just going to draw a big box here and paste. When you copy and paste text into InDesign, it always leaves the formatting behind. It just wants to use the default formatting that it has. Usually that's a very good thing. But if you place by importing it, then it holds on to the formatting. And often I tell it to turn it off because there are a lot of things that we bring in from other applications that we really don't want. We're going to be formatting this in InDesign. I'm going to select it all. I'm going to choose Adobe Garamond. So I'm just going to Hold down that type menu, and you can see that I have a lot of fonts. So I'm going to start typing, and it will refine that search to show me just those fonts that start with G-A-R-A. -A. And here's my whole Garamond family. I'm going to make that uh, Garamond Pro semi-bold and increase the size, because this is way too small. And that's a little bit big. So maybe what I'll do is increase the line spacing, and that's what I'm seeing right below with the two A's stacked one on top of each other. So you know, you guys know that when you see brochures and stuff often, you know, they open up the line space in a little bit so it's a little bit easier for people to read. And I definitely don't want this to be black. So I'm going to go over to my swatches panel, make sure that the T is highlighted, which tells me that it's going to fill the type rather than fill the box that the type is in. Because I can have the box in one color and I can have the text in another color. And I'm going to also just make this green. And maybe bring this down just a little bit. All right, now I need some captions. So with my type tool, I'm going to just drag a box across the bottom here. Go back to my text file, which I'm pretty sure I have open still. Yep. And choose my first caption. I'm going to duplicate that. Select all the text, go back to my text file, copy the next caption, and replace that with the new caption. Now I'm sure you've probably noticed these little plus signs, red plus signs at the bottom. In InDesign, that's the warning that you have too much text in a text box. It's not going to show, it's not going to print because it's it doesn't fit. So it's an overflow. And, and if I look at this, I think, okay, why, are, why is there so much space between these? I don't know whether it's because someone added space below or whether there's extra paragraph turns, returns. But if I go to the type menu and choose show hidden characters, 
I get a, lo a little road map. What's the deal? Are these 20, someone has tabbed, you know, 50 times and pushed this thing down, or have they added a million spaces? And right now I can see those little Pilcro symbols, so I know that there's just extra paragraph returns and some extra spaces, which I don't need. So let's take care of those. All right, um, I'm going to format this first one. Again, I'm going to go back to my lithos, which I think is kind of cool for a heading. Make it a little bit smaller. And I'm going to make it blue, dark blue. Now, that took me not very long, but if I have five more captions, that's going to really start adding up. And I don't want to do that five different times because now if somebody comes back later and decides that they don't want that color or they don't want that font, I've got to go back and change it five more times. So this is why InDesign has a really powerful styles feature. And they have character styles, paragraph styles, table styles, object styles. And it's so that I can define a style for something and then apply it to anything that I click on. Now, for longer documents, it's absolutely essential. But even for something like this, if I knew that I was going to be creating multiple brochures and I wanted the same look and feel, the styles are really helpful. Now, I only have two captions here. I probably, if it was a real job, I probably wouldn't take the time. But if I knew that someone was going to come back and probably offer some changes, I might do that because I don't want to have to keep doing this hand formatting. So I'm going to create a paragraph style. I do that just by going to my Paragraph Styles panel and just choosing New Paragraph Style. What I love about InDesign, all right, let me cancel this for a second. Everybody go up to the area to the left of that little search panel, hold that down, and choose Advanced. Okay, one more thing on why we're over here talking about panels. If there's a panel that you don't see that you need, they all live on this window menu. Anything you want that's a panel is listed here. And it might be on a submenu, but it's there. So I'm going to have everybody add one panel so that they know how to customize that panel. And a good one is uh, text wrap, because we love having text wrap around images. When you get text wrap, does it get dropped like right in the middle of your page? Right. So just take your cursor, put it across that top panel that bar, drag it over, and when you see a blue line below the last panel and let go, it's now docked. We call this our dock. And it's going to remember this the next time you open up InDesign. It's a sticky edit. To access that, I just open and close, and I can get that information. All right, so let's go to our Paragraph Styles panel. Again, choose New Paragraph Style. InDesign has kept track of all the attributes in this journey to Banyan Cliff. So I don't have to redefine it. It knows exactly what it is. So I'm going to call this caption title. And I want to make sure that this little checkbox here, apply style to this selection, is turned on so that I don't have to apply it later. It'll automatically apply this new style to my selection. Click OK. And this is why we use styles. I'm going to click now on taking the plunge. Click on caption title, and voila, it's done. Now later we're going to go back because someone's going to say we don't like that color, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to change all of them at one time. For the caption underneath, again, I'm going to use uh, Garamond Pro. I'm going to probably make that um, regular. Bring that size way down, something like 9 point. And I'll make a new paragraph style for that, just called Caption. And again, I just click on the other caption, apply it, and it's done. I want to get rid of these extra paragraph returns. All right, so now tomorrow, somebody comes back and sees my layout, and they say, uh, you know, that color isn't really going really well with that green. So we would like to see some other colors. Maybe they want um, a lighter blue. I don't have many colors in here. Um, let's just do red, even though you don't usually want to use red because it kind of screams at people. You say They look at that and say, that's perfect. That's what I want. I want this Christmas look. No. <laughs> um, so 
I don't have to go back and remember what color I chose, what font I changed it to. All I have to do is put my cursor in the revised paragraph, go back to my paragraph panel, and notice that it's telling me, whoa, you made a change. This is not the definition you created for caption title. So what do you want me to do about it? You want me to get rid of those overrides, or do you want me to accept this as the new style? And that's what I want to do. So I right click. Notice there's a clear overrides. It'll get rid of all those things that I did. Maybe I was just experimenting. I want to get back to what I defined. But I can also choose this one called redefine style. When I choose that, it's going to change every paragraph that uses this paragraph style. So if I had 500 of them, they would all change in a matter of two seconds. Pretty cool when you're doing a much longer document. In this case, it's not as exciting. But it did make the change, right? OK, I'm going to bring in two more images, just because bringing in images is the big re one of the big reasons we're using InDesign. So I want to make sure that nothing is selected. If you have a text box selected and you import an image, it will replace the text with the image, because InDesign thinks you want to convert it from a text box to an image box. So I want to make sure nothing is selected. Click out in the pasteboard area often is a nice, quick way to do that. Again, bring this in. And I'm going to bring in multiple photos this time. And I want to show you how that works. It's really fun. So I'm selecting multiple photos by using my command key, which lets you select discontiguous images. Or I could have used my shift key if I had four in a row. And now I get my loaded cursor. But I don't want the map again. So I'm going to use my down arrow and go through these, deciding which one I want to put in. I think I want this one here on the left. So I'm going to, instead of letting it take up as much space as it wants, I'm going to control how big it is by dragging across, get that first column. I'm going to move it up slightly so it's not in the way of that caption. Again, I don't want the map. So I'm going to go ahead and drag across again. And I've got my second image. And in the end, I decided that map is repetition and I don't want to put it. So I just hit my escape key and it goes away. You can have 20, 30 photos, as many as you want, and just flip through them so that you're not going back and doing place, place, place. Now let's zoom out. I'm going to preview. We have two preview. We have a preview command that you can implement several different ways. I can do it from up here. Um, if you have a two-column setup, and you can have a single column or a two-column setup, it's, this is the preview button, this is the normal. If you, have no, if you do not have a text tool selected, you can use W to go between preview and non-preview. And what's nice about preview is that it turns off all text symbols, turns off all guides, all frame edges, so you can really get a feel for whether this is going to work for you. 